Hello everybody, my name is Liz Darlison. I'm the CEO of Music Dilemma UK and um, you will be aware that we've been doing a series of interviews with people to probably just help keep the mesothelioma community together, but just to uh, shine a light on different um, challenges um, of being diagnosed with mesothelioma. And um, today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Chris Willis. Um, some of you will recall that Chris spoke at our patient carer conference 18 months ago, um, which was seems a whole lifetime ago now because so much has happened for everybody. Um, not least for you, Chris, and I know we're going to hear a little bit about that. Um, but we thought it'd be really interesting um, to uh, make contact with Chris and ask him if he wanted to give us a bit of an update on, uh, on what's been happening to him over the last 18 months. Um, but of course, for those of you that weren't um, at that patient care a day or haven't um, been in touch with Chris through social media or anything, you won't know the start of the story. So. Um, We'll probably start with that at the start of the story. But first, Chris, thank you so much for agreeing to chat with us this afternoon. And um, I guess the first thing, let's just tell us a little bit about you, about um, about Chris Willis, rather than about your mesothelioma experience, um, what you do and where you live or whatever you want to share with us. It'd be great. Um, so obviously, my name is Chris Willis. I'm 32 years old and I was diagnosed with mesothelioma in February 2018, um, but I originally from the, the Northeast, um, where I went to uni there, had a great friendship group, a large family, um, and at around about 22, 23, um, finished all my degrees and all my teaching degrees, moved down to London, then to the big smoke, and started teaching, and I've been teaching now for around about nine years. Uh, I currently work in an inner city school with over 2,000 students and I'm currently ahead of year but my obviously trade as a teacher is a PE teacher um, and recently got married two years ago uh, to my wife Evelyn um, and yeah it's just been quite a, a long journey over the last four or five years I would say. And I recall uh, Chris when I first met you I remember how passionate you are about teaching um, yeah and uh, how it was really important to you to get back to teaching and uh, to be able to continue with your career uh, despite um, what life's thrown at you with your diagnosis of mesothelioma and I, are you still as with all the challenges of covid and virtual teaching are you still as passionate as ever about your role or about your career yeah i've, I've obviously been since february 2018 it's been a bit up and down um, but i've got a very supportive school a very supportive head teacher and colleagues um, and when I am fit and well, um, I am generally working 50 to 60 hours a week with the, with the students and staff. And it, it, that was one of my biggest motivations. Um, I'm not one that generally can sit around and just watch TV. It's great for two, you know, a couple of days on the weekend or during half term. Um, but that was one of my big sort of motivations and drives to get back to full time work um, and see the, see the students and see the colleagues. Um, and everything was going well until obviously this time last year when COVID hit um, and I was still able to work and then I, I had to shield from the government guidelines and then uh, September of last year 2020 we just started getting back in the swing of things and then the, the second strain or the third strain whatever it was then shut the school down and uh, unfortunately I got that letter again through the post I think it was Monday or Tuesday of this week saying that they, they recommend I shield, on, shield until at least the 31st of March um, and we're hoping the students will be coming back to school in the next two weeks. Um, but I've had my first vaccine anyway. I was going to uh, ask you that. Yeah, I've had my first vaccine. I, I got it in the middle of January and then my second one is due um, at the end of April. So fingers crossed with everything going on, I'll be able to, to get back to you know what I'm passionate about teaching um, and get into it again well utmost respect for all teachers at the minute I think that parents having to homeschool have actually got a taste of what it's like uh, to to teach and so hats off to you anyway but during covid time then uh, double so I guess so it's three years ago I think since you were diagnosed with mesothelioma or thereabouts um, can you just yeah. take us back to that time and tell us just briefly, what, what happened and how you knew something was wrong and your experience. 
Yeah, so I think my experience is a little different to, to most mesothelioma patients uh, in one sense of my age and obviously the second sense of how I was actually diagnosed. Uh, so I was diagnosed um, when I was 29 um, and before I was diagnosed, never even heard of the word mesothelioma and didn't really understand what asbestos was as well. Um, but I had just joined the school that I'm currently at now and I was, I was really getting into sort of a fitness regime, cycling 60, 70 miles a week. Uh, going to gym um, and I just noticed that I was getting tired really often and I was just putting it down to the extra exercise and the long hours trying to make a good impression at the new school you know um, and then it got to the point where I was cycling home one day on my bike and I hit a speed bump and the pain in my stomach was just unbelievable um, and just ignored it being a typical bloke you know just ignored all the signs and then gradually over the next couple of months my stomach was just getting bigger and bigger. Every time I was eating, I was only able to have two or three mouthfuls and just feel them full. Anyway, I went to the doctors um, and they just put it down to like a bad stomach, a bit of stress, etc. And they said, we'll monitor it. Left it, went back again um, and they examined me and they found that there was a lump um, just above my belly button. Um, and they sent me to a &E, went to a &E, scanned me, x-rayed me and found that I had a, a mini hernia and they put the hernia down to a small blockage in the intestines. And that's why I was getting such bad stomach pains and so on. So I got the operation about four weeks later. Um, everything was going fine. Had two weeks off school. Everything was great. Started getting exercise. And another three or four months later, um, the pain, the bloatedness, the fullness, the sickness just come back. Um, but it come back with a vengeance, really. And I went to the doctors again. And they just said it was just the body, you know, getting used to everything. And at this point, I was getting a bit sort of stressed with the, the GP practice and everything. And then finally went back and literally collapsed in the GP surgery, um, sweating, um, sort of dehydrated. And then this lovely doctor who I'd never met called for an ambulance. I was whisked off to a and &E. um, They did some scans and realised that I had a... The, the initial scans that I had shown that I had a shrunken liver. Um, I had around about 10 to 14 litres of ascites on the abdomen. Um, and from when they weighed me before my hernia operation to where I was, I'd lost around 20 kilograms in weight. Gosh. Um, and I knew I had lost weight, but I didn't realise to the extent of that. Um, so it was a long sort of um, process, bounced from one specialist to another, uh, they drained the ascites off over uh, two sessions um, because they said that they couldn't drain it all off in one because it would shock the system. Um, I had um, sort of biopsies of the abdomen wall, CT scans that showed thickness. Uh, I had guided CT biopsies. I had keyhole surgery. I had a, a, a laparotomy um, where they cut me from pretty much my chest to my belly button for exploratory surgery. Um, and then in January, when I had that surgery, the exploratory surgery, they found I had around about eight to 10 polyps um, on the lining of the abdomen, which I had in St. Thomas's. Um, and they sent that off. And then I think it was at the start of February, I remember going into St. Thomas's, the doctor who had it and said, um, unfortunately, you've got mesothelioma. Um, and she didn't really go into it. She didn't say it was a cancer. She didn't tell us what it actually was. And she said that I'd be referred to uh, Guy's Hospital, uh, the neighbouring hospital, where there's a specialist who I'd meet, James Spicer. Um, and he was apparently the, the top, top bloke at that time in that area. Um, and I remember we shook hands, we thanked for everything, you know, just saying at least we now know what it is. And I wasn't aware of actually what it was, so I was quite happy. And as I left, I was in the room with uh, Evelyn and my mom. She'd come down from Newcastle. And I remember, I'll never forget, she said, Chris, just promise me one thing. When you leave this room, don't go on your phone and type in mesothelioma into Google. Just promise me that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And you Typical did. Typical, you know. And when someone tells you not to do something, you start to realise. So I didn't. We went to the pub. We had a couple of pints. Went home. And then everybody went to bed. And I just thought, oh, let's have a look at what actually is. Is it going to be medication? Do I need another surgery? And then I remember looking at it and the first thing come up, it said terminal cancer and then expect that, um, something like 95% of 
diagnose patients die within six to 12 months. And that's all I remember. And then things just sort of spiraled out of control from there. My word. So that was three years ago now. And how long was it from when you first went to the doctors feeling unwell, feeling tired on your bike that day to actually the point of getting diagnosed? How many months went by? I would say, I, I think my first initial doctor's appointment was April 2017. So you're looking at about 10 months. 10 months, gosh. And it was probably within that 10 month period, there was about five months of serious investigation where biopsies, fluid samples, CTs were all just coming back as inconclusive. They knew something was wrong. But couldn't find it. You didn't know what was wrong. And you're 29 years old, just yeah. starting out in life, in your career. And, and that, it just seems so cruel, doesn't it? But, you know, a meso is elusive like that sometimes. It's not sometimes easy to pin it down and find it. So you're diagnosed with peritoneal mesothelioma. And uh, what treatment did you have in those first few months? So when I met James Spicer and Rachel Thomas at Guys, um, I didn't actually have any sort of intervention straight away, which I found very strange. You know, I've been told I had terminal cancer and I just wanted them to blast me with everything. But what they had said was uh, remove all visible disease um, and there wasn't actually anything that they needed to do. So they sort of said it was like you sort of watch and wait and see if anything develops. Um, and that was obviously February 2018, went back to work full time, living life, you know, obviously it had a real couple of dark months where I had to see a psychologist and sort of get support, but eventually got back to work, thinking everything was getting back on track. Um, and then I started getting a pain in my shoulder. Um, and typical me again, just said, you know, shift down to work, exhaustion, you know, being a PE teacher, I'll probably just tweak something. Anyway, um, I rang Rachel up uh, to let her know, and she was like, no, we can't take any risks. We'll get you an emergency CT scan. So that was the start of August. Um, had the CT scan within two or three days, and was and I had already had a, a doctor, a, a hospital appointment booked two weeks after that. So they said, we'll just discuss the results then. I'm sure it's nothing. And then within 24 hours, I got the unknown ID. So I picked it up. It was Rachel saying, hi, Chris. Um, unfortunately, something's shown up on this CT scan. Um, we've looked at it and we've got specialists involved. And it looks like you've got about three and a half to four litres of fluid on your right lung. Uh, you need to come into hospital tomorrow morning. ASAP, bring Evelyn with you. James is going to speak to you. We'll formulate a plan. Um, went in there. They said it needed to be drained off. Um, they said it could just be an infection um, or it could be mesothelioma in the lung as well. And so we've seen a special uh, Dr. Bailey, a guy, he did the sort of um, surgery where they put the tube in, drained everything off. He was in hospital for about four days and then two weeks later I met with him and he said, yeah, it's mesothelioma in the right lung. And he said that he's been quite into mesothelioma for the last five or six years. And he had only met two patients prior to me that actually had it in the abdomen and the lung as a result of exposure. Gosh, so you stop, I mean, the, the, a couple of things there that I just wanted to pick up on. The, the one thing is that you you recognise that your mood and your the emotional impact on your mental health uh, was clearly evident, and you you, you got support with that. Um, you know, yeah, so it was quite a dark time. I didn't want to talk to anyone. Um, my parents were staying down. I didn't want them anywhere around us. Um, I didn't want Evelyn anywhere near around me. I remember sort of thinking, should I have the conversation to say, you know, the front door is there. You don't need to be a part of this. You're young. Go out and live your life, all that sort of stuff. And it was a real um, dark period of time. Um, and I eventually got in contact with a charity from Southampton who come up and uh, supported me, talked me through what was available. Um, and they just said, you know, this is what's available, but you need to engage in it. We can't force you. Um, and eventually just started engaging with it and met a psychologist um, and spoke through. But I, I never forget, and obviously you'll probably remember this from my speech in Blackpool, that every time I went to bed, I just remember looking at that red light on my TV and just thinking to myself, you know, wouldn't it be so much easier just to take a load of, you know, tablets now and just end it without any pain or anything like that um, and I, I was always one of those who you know used to watch these programs and see people take their lives and go how selfish were they 
you know, and leaving all these loved ones. But I was actually in a position where I could understand people's mental health and the state and then sort of realise why people are actually going to put Obviously, after time and the support of family and friends and the NHS, you know, you get yourself back on track. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I feel it's unfair of me to even comment or say because I'm not living your life and I'm not living with me, though. But, you know, just from all the years I've worked with people, uh, you know, as tough as life gets, there's always life to be had, you know. Mm. And if you can crawl out of that dark hole, and if you need help in any way, um, you know, it's great to reach out and get that help. But, you know, just take every bit of help you can to get out of that hole because you can, you know, it doesn't matter what life throws at you. There is some joy in life to be had. Yeah. And it's different and it might be less. It might be in a different way, shape or form. And um, but it is possible. So I, I just wanted to pick up on that because I think it's great that you actually said I need help. I need some, you know, and um everybody has that you know that looking at the red light on the telly moment in their life for all, all sorts of reasons um so I think it's good just to capture that you've had that time um but you've managed to find a way to live with mesothelioma and the other thing I wanted to point out was the access to your specialist nurse uh, so Rachel who's the meso UK nurse that guys um you know a wonderful member of our team and um you know, that's just what the nurses are there for you, just to say, no, I'm worried about this. Let's just crack on and just investigate. And, um, you know, and, and I think it's, you know, I just wanted to stress, it's really important, I think, to build up a relationship with your healthcare team and to have some trust and build, you know, be able to um, just use them as a sounding board and to have those open and honest conversations because um, sometimes it's not easy for the healthcare team to, pick up the phone and, and make that call to you you know they we do stress over it we get very you know anxious about it but um if you've got a relationship with them with with you know the stronger the relationship with the patients the easier it is to do it really so I just again wanted to pick up on that so what treatment did you have initially you know what um so after after the lung operation uh we started chemotherapy immediately and it was two i think it was cisplatin pemetrexin yeah. or something along those lines um, which was an eight hour infusion and that was hell um, absolute hell and i managed to get through the six infusions just yeah. for the fact is that i was sort of in the right frame of mind i had prepared myself and i thought i'm not gonna you know quit and i, I just wanted to get through it um, and it had great results, actually. Um, after the final scan, after the six infusions, um, it had shrunk the, the tumour in the abdomen by a third. Um, so we were really pleased with that. Um, and then we had a break. And then, unfortunately, the tumour started to grow again, as, it, as we always knew it would. And then we went on to carbon platen, um, a different type of drug just to mix it up. And again, that was... Hell, and I could only actually uh, handle three cycles of that. Was um, that a tablet that you had? No, it was still an infusion. infusion. Um, but I did then obviously go on to a tablet after that, the ones I couldn't, which was, um, I think, Vin the V. Vinoral bean. Yeah. yeah. And I'll never forget when James and Rachel said, you're going to go on to a tablet, I was so happy because I thought, yeah, a tablet's going to be fantastic. Take the tablet, everything Sweet. will be fine. Remember, I looked at, yeah, took the tablet, and within about four hours, I thought that was it. I thought if this is all what life is worth, going into hospital every other day, getting blood, having scans, and feeling like this, then it's it's not worth. And uh, when I was looking through my book, um, my cancer book recently, I'd actually had around about nineteen uh, chemotherapy sessions. And out of those 19 chemotherapies from the three different drugs, um, I was admitted into an acute oncology 15 times. Gosh. And I was actually admitted into hospital seven times. Um, yeah. Just because the body just couldn't handle it, which I was, which I was shocked at because, you know, being a 29, 30-year-old male, very fit, I, I thought it would be walking the park. I thought, you know, it would be feeling rough for a day or two and then just get on. It, it was nothing like that. It was absolutely horrendous. And I remember 
having the conversation with James, Rachel and Evelyn saying, um, you know what, if this is what life is worth living, then I want to stop and I'll just deal with whatever comes next, but no more treatments. I um, think, wasn't that the point where we met you at the patient care day around that time? Yeah, yeah. pretty much where we had stopped everything and it was a case of go and enjoy yourself for a couple of months. Let me, let James and Rachel explore what was out there and what they could get me on, etc. And then we'll revisit it in, in August. I think, um, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it just suffice to say that you had a you had a rough ride and we can never predict, you know, who's going to have those kind of uh, quite extreme responses to chemotherapy. Um, and most people do not have that really challenging, not as challenging as that. You know, I, I think uh, 15, uh, you know, visits to acute oncology and seven admissions is absolutely extreme. And it's, you know, it's real bad luck that that was, um, but thankfully, it did. You did get some benefit in all of that. But um, so eventually, um, what was the next treatment? When did that come? Um, so obviously, we we enjoyed a bit of our time, um, and me and Evan loved to go travelling, etc. Um, and then I started feeling unwell again, um, and we actually got the hospice involved, where the nurses used to come out every day and sort of give me some uh, injections and stuff. Uh, and I was put on to um, a syringe driver, actually. Is this um, beginning of last year now, beginning of 20? Yeah, so this would have been um, around, well, actually around about, yeah, January time. We had just been on holiday to Lanzarote for New Year. Um, and we got the syringe driver, everything was going well. And then I just remember the district nurse come out one day and said, oh, your arm's a bit red. I was like, is it? He's like, yeah, it's a bit red. We'll just keep an eye on it. And then 24 hours later, I had a bit of a fever, then felt a bit sick, and then had the worst stomach pains ever. Um, anyway, to cut a short story, um, to, to get to the point, I was then blue lighted to the hospice um, for some respite and had a conversation with the doctor, with everybody in the room. And the doctor was like, we've got two options. We either try and ride it out here or you go to St. Thomas's again. Um, and he was sort of saying that, you know, if you're tired and you've had enough, stay with us. If you're ready for another fight, we're ready to give you. So went there, went to St. Thomas's, got diagnosed with sepsis and an acute bowel obstruction. Um, and then was admitted into guys, got transferred to guys. And I was in hospital for in total around about seven weeks. Um, had no white blood cells, was sort of in this bubble where everybody who come to me was fully maxed, maxed up overalls and this was before even COVID got yeah. to the um and I remember having a very difficult two difficult conversations first conversation was with a doctor who said you know you are on the limit now it's sort of he didn't use the word touch and go but you can read people's sort of conversations and face and then an hour later I had two um palliative care nurses coming up to me saying do they want me to be put into a side room do they want to go down to the palliative care ward I was like no I'm, I'm happy here you know just leave me alone um, and then the second conversation was with um, James Spicer who come around with um, all his students and they were examining looking at the scans and then he asked for a bit of privacy from the students and he sort of sat down um, and he said that we need to have a difficult conversation about resuscitation um, my advice to you is we don't advise you to be resuscitated. The way your body is at the moment, if it decides to shut down, um, I, we wouldn't advise you to be resuscitated because, in my opinion, there's no coming back from it. And we had this conversation and we were going, why are we coming? And he was going, literally, you're on the edge now. It's, it's going to be one way or the other. Um, and we don't quite know what way it's going to go. Um, and I just remember lying in at that point, I didn't get upset. I wasn't angry or anything. And I spent a lot of time in the hospital just on my own, you know, with it. And it, it sort of dawned on me that I had actually come to terms with everything. If, if this was the time, this was the time. I had a great three years prior to that. I had a lovely wife. If this was it, then so be it. And then miraculously, day after day, I just got stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and then finally got out. And then with everything going on, we, Rachel and James, applied for... Uh, 
something like a, a compassionate funding scheme on the NHS. And this is before um, the immunotherapy that I'm currently on was um, given to the NHS. So I managed to get on that, um, which is Nivolumab, I think it's called. Nivolumab um, and Ipilimumab. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and I started that um, around about June time, July time of last year. And I've I managed to get on it for two years free of charge. Um, and that is what I'm currently on now. And what's happened to the tumour? Um, so I had, I'm actually going for my fifth cycle um, tomorrow. And in each cycle is three infusions. So this will be around about the 15th infusion I have as of tomorrow. We did some scans around about eight weeks ago. And actually, it's it's been a fantastic um, sort of experience. First thing that is all fluid from the lung and the abdomen has disappeared. And I'd roughly had around about two and a half litres uh, build up. There's now no evidence or signs of any uh, ob obstruction of the bowel or the intestines, which it was previously. Um, and before I started the... Um, immunotherapy the tumor was around about 10 centimeters in the abdomen um, and it's now been pinned back around about to eight centimeters um, so it's done three great things so far um, and James and Rachel are saying that obviously the longer I'm on and the more the body gets its antibodies and stuff they're, they're hoping that when I have a scan in another four or five months we'll see even more further improvements hopefully of the of the tumor because that in theory is the only thing left to fight. The other issues that I had have all disappeared as well. I mean, Chris, to look at you, I mean, you just you just look like a young, healthy man. To, you know, you don't look like there's any... And to think that you and your body and your family and your mum and Evelyn have been through all of that with you, it just, you know, it chokes me to just... And, you know, I think of James sitting on your bed, James Spicer, and, you know, knowing... James and people, you know, other oncologists like him and how much they come to care about their patients. You know, it's just unbelievable that that has all happened and, and access to one combination of immunotherapy seems to have been the thing that's helped you turn a, turn a corner, you know, which is, um, and the, the one thing, I, the other thing I just wanted to pick up on, you said that you were at you know, you were at your lowest ebb, you'd had that conversation with the, with the palliative care nurses and then uh, the oncologist had sat on your bed and you had the, the do not resuscitate conversation. Um, but you were at peace with it all. And despite everything that you'd been through, spiritually, you were clearly in a good place to, yeah. you know, um, and, I, and, and some that being in a spiritually good place is really important as bad as life gets um, and being able to be in a spiritually good place I think is a huge challenge yeah. you know um I've always said that I've never been afraid of dying the thing that used to get me upset and angry was leaving people behind to deal with that so obviously I've got an amazing wife I've got an amazing family man dad and brother I've got a fantastic network of friends and colleagues. And we have all known somebody who's passed away in the family or friends, and we all know what that grief can do to people. And my worry was always that if anything was to happen to me, we have a mortgage to pay, you know, we don't have children with everything going on, but to, to leave somebody a massive mortgage and then have to deal, you know, Evelyn's younger than me, she's, she's only 31. And, you know, saying to Evelyn that in one sense, that's awful, but in another sense, you're quite lucky that you're young, you'll meet someone else and having those difficult conversations. So I was never afraid of, like, what would happen to me. I could deal with that because inevitably, that my dad always said, there's only two things that are certain in life. One, you pay taxes and one, everybody's going to have to go at some point. Um, but it was also, it was the big thing that used to get me was the feeling of leaving pain for everyone, my mom and dad losing a child, Evelyn losing a husband. Um, and then I just started looking into things and reading the sort of stories of people who have died young and, you know, reading books and articles and actually realizing that as long as you feel like you fulfilled your life and you made a difference, then it doesn't matter what time or what age you go. And then you start reading quotes like you're not here for a long time, you're here for a good time. 
Uh, you never know what's around the corner. You can get hit by a bus. You just never know. But I just reflected on my life and thought, you know, I've, I've done what I wanted to do in the professional world. I've changed a lot of students' life for the better. I've met an amazing woman. I've got an amazing family, you know. And some people go through life and die at the age of 90 and never have that. And I've been one of the lucky ones and just thought, you know, when the time comes, you know, and hopefully it'll be in 20, 30, 40 years, um, you know, that's when it comes and there's nothing I can do about it. But what I can control is my own emotions and have things step aside and I can go on my terms rather than the disease choosing when that wants to take control, you know. It's just shows what an amazingly selfless person you are really but I, I just think you know you're a, a very well respected senior oncologist said you're on the edge so you have been on the edge and mm. lots of us haven't and the fact that you've been over the edge and looked over and you're still not afraid and you still have got that same kind of uh maybe it's your northern blood I don't know but um it's um it's very reassuring and um I, I think it's quite a priceless place to be um and i think you know i it, it's something that i often hope to help patients achieve um because i don't think it matters i think you, it doesn't matter whether you're 30 or 60 or 70 if you can have that spiritual well-being it's much easier to face what life's um gonna throw at you have have you had any side effects at all from the immunotherapy none whatsoever so like i said with all the hospital admissions from obviously chemotherapy and everything um it, it, it was crazy i have it every i have it on a friday and the reason why we had it on a friday was then everyone would be at home with me at the weekend to help me through all the side effects etc and then nothing's happened not one side effect whatsoever um it's almost like funny enough I'll, I'll have the treatment tomorrow I'll be home for about two o'clock I'll have a large lunch and then by seven eight o'clock I'll be having a couple of pints sitting on the set leave as if it was just a normal day wake up on Saturday go for a long walk no side effects whatsoever which was the biggest thing for me it you know, sounds having, like you had your fair share with the first few rounds of treatment having the bonus of obviously it's reducing the tumor and sort of fixing everything uh, physiological that is a bonus to me because all I wanted to do was feel okay. Um, and if I felt okay, that was the main part. And having the bonus of reducing tumor sizes and other medical is, is just fantastic. Can I, um, I mean, I'm delighted, absolutely. Of course, there's no guarantee that immunotherapy is going to work for everybody in the same way it has for you, but it is definitely given us a new weapon in our armory. Um, we haven't got that blanket access at the moment. And at the minute, we don't have to do it in the same way that you applied through compassionate use. There is um, an early access to medicine scheme. So it's the next level and it's a little bit easier. And of course, what we're looking forward to ultimately is that it will go through a technical appraisal later this year and NICE will approve it. And we won't, you know, we'll be able to offer it to patients within um, the criteria that was um, used in the drug trial. But um, you know, so I, it's, it's lovely to hear your story. And some people do have side effects, you know, um, they're very different to chemotherapy. And um, obviously, I think if anybody's contemplating immunotherapy or making that decision at the minute, you know, have a chat with the healthcare team around you to really learn about those side effects. But I'm absolutely delighted for you, Chris, because you have literally been, you and your family, your loved ones have been through the ringer and back again um, over the last three years. I just wondered... Do, do the kids at school, do any of them know about, uh, do they call you Chris or Mr. Willis? Do they know what your personal life uh, involves? Um, so I'm ahead of year. So I'm currently head of year of year 11 and I've had them more away from year seven. So I've got a fantastic group of students. And they know something's not right. Um, and that is because sometimes I walk into school and I've had feeding tubes in and I've still went to school um, I've, I've got a pick line in and sometimes when I'm teaching or I'm doing assemblies that'll drop out and you can see them all looking and thinking what is that you know um, and I've got two amazing colleagues that I work with and on a, a very close on a day-to-day -day 
Um, and I, I've, I've never, you know, some students have asked me, am I unwell? And I've said, yeah, I'm extremely unwell. Um, and some students should go and ask the question, but they definitely know that um, something is up. And unfortunately, we have a girl in our year group who is going through leukemia at the moment, uh, who's 15, and we struck up a really good bond with her because she'll tell you herself that talking to mom and nurses, etc. cetera, um, they don't understand psychologically what everything's going on. And we always have a laugh and a joke saying, you know, I've got to go for another blood test and blah, 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 and, and, you know, have a laugh. And, and I will say, listen, don't get annoyed with the doctors or the nurses. They're just there to, to sort of help you. And they always go, yeah, but they always say it won't hurt, but it always does hurt. And have they lay on a table and had, you know, these procedures? And I go, I know. But it's just about, and you know, we, we've built up a very good relationship with her just because she's going through a bit of a dark time and especially with COVID going on, she can't yeah. get and see her friends. But um, a lot of colleagues know, they know that I'm unwell, um, but they don't know it's mesothelioma, they just assume it's a sort of a cancer. Um, but yeah, the school's very supportive and the kids are always great. They always drop me emails and when I'm in school, they're always running over, you know, saying I'm so glad you're back hope you're feeling well if you need anything you know so it's great do you know Chris you never um when you're talking about the kids you're smiling continually and your eyes light up so you're obviously you know a very very uh, natural teacher and uh, you know clearly you've got a great relationship with your kids and uh, with the kids and that's so important is it in education um I think hearing your story is so encouraging for people who uh, you know, reach that point with a red light on the telly and want to chuck it all in or, um, but if there's a shred of hope, sometimes hanging on to it is the right thing to do. And, you know, you don't know what's around the corner for you. I don't know what's around the corner for me, you know, and we just have to um, do the best we absolutely can. And I, I think hearing your story is an absolute inspiration. And, you know, for me as a healthcare professional, I'm sometimes helping patients to make that decision. And, um, it's, it's good to hear when people have had your experience because, you you know, I feel better able to support people making those decisions. Um, you know, so it's all, it's for everybody, you know, it's an, ins you're an inspiration to share that. I just, before we close, I just wondered if there was one thing that you would, you know, if there was another 29, 30 year old person being diagnosed tomorrow, um, is there one bit of advice you would you would say apart from don't look on google but <laughs> <laughs> um there, there's probably loads of advice i'd say but the the only the, the thing i would say to someone at my age is that life isn't over there's there's plenty to live for and whether like i said to you before whether that's a year whether that's 10 years or it's 30 years there's always something there worth fighting for and living for and if you don't think there is then don't be afraid to ask for support and help. Yeah, lovely. Well, that's absolutely wonderful advice. Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure yet again. Um, so that, let's make this every 18 months, shall we? We'll have a, an, up, a, a, an official update. It'd be nice to talk to you in between, of course, but official update every 18 months. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, lovely. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you.